All right, hey everybody. So this video is gonna be a brief overview into chest tubes and how chest tubes work. Uh, put on by Made School, Made Easy. Hey, 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 good to see you. Uh, this is highly anticipated and it's about time we make this video. So, um, first things first, these chest tubes are gonna come in a whole host of different ranges of sizes. The ones we're gonna talk about for trauma are usually gonna be somewhere between the 28 to 38 French size. Uh, French is a type of measurement that uh, the poor man's way to determine how big that is, is if you divide this by three, or some people say pi, you get the size in millimeters. So if you had a, a 30 French chest tube, divided by three is about 10 millimeters wide. So it gives you an idea of how big these chest tubes are. Uh, 30 French, which would be in this range of trauma, is about one centimeter wide. Okay, boom, now I got that out of the way. Your chest tube, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make an incision on the chest, the chest wall will be here. This purple line denotes the pleural cavity or the uh, parietal pleura, the outside line of the chest wall. Here you can see the lung and the lung has uh, fallen away. This would be uh, like a hemothorax, would be a fluid collection with blunting of the costophrenic angle on this side. This would be a pneumothorax with air up here. This would be a mixed level, um, uh, mixed uh, hydro pneumothorax or something like that. This is commonly seen in trauma. And so what we're gonna do is make our incision over the fourth or fifth intercostal space. Uh, we're gonna dissect down to the soft tissue. We're gonna get to the rib. Now, <clears throat> when you look at your ribs, if you look at it on cross section, at the bottom, this is the poor drawing, on the bottom it kind of has this lip of bone to it, and that's because this is where the neurovascular bundle lives. And so when we're going in, we're gonna try and go right down onto a rib, and then we're gonna work our way up above the rib. So we actually go, if this is a rib in space, we're gonna go right above it into the chest wall to try and avoid this neurovascular bundle, okay? Some people say you have to tunnel up a space, meaning you'd actually make your incision down here, and you'd tunnel way up, you'd feel this intercostal space, you tunnel way up, I don't uh, condone that uh, process. I don't think it's shown any mortality benefit or air leak benefit. So I would just say go to the next intercostal space above you and tunnel in, or punch in, I should say. Um, when you get to that pleura, this parietal pleura actually has a pretty good uh, uh, strength to it. And so when you pop in, um, a lot of people have a satisfying pop when they pop in the pleura. If you're watching someone do it, you know when they get in the chest because you see that. When that person spreads to create their, their entry opening, you'll see fluid and blood and, and air, you'll hear air come out, and that tells you, hey, I'm in the right spot. Your goal then is to angle this chest tube into your desired location inside the pleural cavity. Now, they make, uh, well, they make a whole bunch of different chest tubes, but the ones most commonly seen in their trombe are gonna be straight chest tubes or right angle chest tubes. And they're called that because that's exactly how they look. Classically, straight chest tubes are the most common ones that you see, and these are going to be put into the apex. That's why they're straight, so they might start here, and they'd come up here to the apex, they'd come down. Whereas your right angle ones are designed to go into the patient's base, or the base of their lung, or the base of their pleural cavity, I should say. So when it comes in, it tracks down into the patient's base. It has that nice right angle curve to get you there. Um, again, common things being common, what you're going to see is you're going to see something like a 32 French straight chest tube, and uh, you're in business if you have that. If you're just trying to decompress someone's chest emergently, it doesn't matter what kind of tube you have, you just need to put a hole in their chest with a big knife and get the air out of it. Um, how you know where your chest tube is is important because if you look at your straight chest tube, let's say that, that this is the end of it and it goes on for a long period of time, you're gonna have one hole called the sentinel hole here. It's about eight centimeters away from the end. It can be more, it can be less. And you have other holes at other orientations along the end of the tube. So this would be the far end, the distal end. This sentinel hole is important because it has a radio opaque line going on the chest tube for its entire duration, except for that sentinel hole. So on a chest x-ray, you can't see this piece of plastic that well, comma, however, when you look at the patient's chest x-ray, you'll see this nice white radio opaque line that stops and then takes off again. And so you know that, hey, that's my first hole, and then I know that I have more holes here, even if I can't see them on chest x-ray, so you know what part of, of uh, the pleural cavity you're accessing with that tube. If, for example, this was the subcutaneous space, and this was like the chest wall or something like that, and this is, or I'm just, yeah, chest wall would be here, and this would be a whole bunch of fat. If your break in your radio peak line is here, 
then you know that, hey, one of my holes, my sentinel hole, is in the sub Q tissue. It's not inside the lung. This might be contributing to an air leak. Your chest tube might be malpositioned. This is something that needs further uh, attention with either replacement, uh, observation, or a CT scan or something like that. Um, in any case, that's, that's a kind of a uh, quick guide to uh, chest tubes and their location on chest X-ray and what you put them in for. Um, so what does a chest tube actually do, right? And so let's say that this is the patient's chest wall and you already put in your awesome chest tube and it's coming out and it's sutured in and you're like, okay, what do I hook this thing up to? Now the big thing is you want to create a one-way valve because you want the patient to be able to breathe and expel gas or expel fluid from their chest to re-inflate their lung, but you don't want air to be sucked back up inside. So one thing you can hook this up to is a one-way valve. Classically or historically, that can be what's called a uh, Heimlich valve. Now a Heimlich valve is a piece of plastic that has a slit on it and it gets bigger. And so what happens is this slit, if air was to be forced this way, this would open up, it would flutter open and air would be able to go out. But if the patient sucked in, these two flaps would close back down together, making this type of uh, contraption again so that's a Heimlich valve or a one-way valve. That is one option if you're trying to transfer this patient, you don't have a pleurovac or you don't have some sort of fancy device to hook it up to. But uh, that's kind of an aside. And really what I want to talk about is I want to talk about your three container system um, that uh, uh, most pleurovacs and uh, Oasis vacs and things are, are set up on, whether they're wet vacs or dry vacs, which is a topic for another day. But in any case, you have this thing. The first thing you want to set it up to is your collection chamber, okay? collection. And now all that this is, is imagine this is a glass jar and it has a cork on the top. The only reason why it's a cork is because it makes it airtight and it sounds old timey, which is when this was invented. It has two small glass pipettes going through the cork, it's airtight, etc. If I take this and I hook it up to the chest tube, okay, and I'm causing suction here, what's going to happen? The liquids that come out of this patient's chest, like blood or liquid or chyle or whatever, are going to drip down because of gravity and they're going to start to accumulate here. Whereas the gas that comes through from a pneumothorax is just going to track right along and it's going to follow the suction out. Okay? The only purpose of this, I'm going to call it the Charlie chamber, is to accumulate fluid. So this glass jar would have some nice volumetric markings on the side of it. And then over time, you could say, hey, this guy's put out a thousand cc's of serosanguinous fluid or frank blood or pus or what have you. And that's the whole purpose of this first container, okay? It's gonna be the Charlie container, it's just for collection. Remember that? I'm gonna redraw this so I don't use up all my space. Okay, so we've hooked up our chest tube to our first container. <clears throat> all we're doing is collecting fluid, nothing special yet. Next, there's gonna be another glass jar. Too easy, right? This, let's call it the Bravo chamber. And this whole thing is gonna be called the water seal. Now, <clears throat> what this does is it has the same deal. Cork on the top, a long glass pipette, and a short glass pipette. What we're gonna do is we're gonna attach the Charlie chamber to the Bravo chamber, and then we're gonna put this to suction. This chamber is a little different than the Charlie one in that in this one we preloaded it with some water. Okay? And this gets a little complicated, but if you bear with me, uh, I think you'll figure it out pretty quickly. So suction. So we're pulling all the air out. We're pulling all the air out. The fluid out of the chest has already been collected, so the only thing coming through here is air. Now, if air wants to come this way, no problem. It can bubble through, right? Think of it when, uh, when you're at a restaurant and you were a kid and you put a straw in a glass of water you're messing around, there's water there, you take your straw and you put it in there and you blow. If I blow, I make bubbles. Conversely, if I tried to suck in or aspirate through my straw, water would rise up my straw, but no bubbles would. So what you're effectively doing is creating a one-way valve that prevents any air from going back in the chest. This is a water seal. And what that does is, when it's on suction, air can escape through, so we've already taken care of the liquids, now we're taking care of the air, but no air can get back in, because if you tried, and this patient inhaled, all that it's doing is raising up and raising down this water level, just like you were at the restaurant when you were a kid. Um, this is called titling. And so in a description of a, of a functional chest tube, 
you might say, hey, this patient's chest tube is uh, titling, and what that means is you can see somewhere on the pleurovac or in the chest tube a fluid level moving with each breath, and that means, hey, this is good, this, this chest tube is still patent, this uh, system is still open and working, uh, and that's what your Bravo chamber is. And now, last but not least, we have one more chamber to go, and we've done our entire system, and this is the alpha chamber, okay? What this is, is it's a suction regulator. This is the most complicated one. Uh, the hardest one to, uh, to memorize, um, but we're going to do it no problem, all right? And so what this is, is another cork. This guy has three pipettes. Boom, boom, and boom. And there's a water level in here, just like there was in the Bravo chamber. Now, too easy like the other ones, i got to connect these pipettes so it's all inline system. And now I have two different outflows, okay? The first outflow is going to be this one. And this is our suction one. So we're gonna hook this up to wall suction in our ICU room or our, our floor room. Um, a common question that you get is, does it matter what your wall suction level is? Does it matter if it's at uh, 80 or 1000 PSI? No, it doesn't. And so for all intents and purposes, let's say we set our wall suction to 22,000 PSI. We hooked it up to a jet engine and the intake from this jet engine is pretty wild and it is um, really, really, really sucking in tons and tons of air, uh, and it has no problem to do that. That doesn't matter at all, and that's the whole purpose of the alpha chamber, okay? So uh, forget what your, what your wall regulator is on the wall. That's a common question from your nursing staff and things like that. So let's say we do that. We set it up super high. We're creating this vortex that's pulling air out. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna pull air in line, right? We pull, pull air from here, too easy. We bubbled it through, we pulled air through here. We're gonna bubble across, but eventually, in this guy's chest, the pneumothorax is gonna be all gone, right? Like let's say this is his chest and his lungs started way down. Over time, as you're sucking on it, boom, 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 and there's gonna be no air left. The visceral and parietal pleura are now well opposed like they're supposed to be. And at that point in time, to prevent the wall suction from sucking on this lung and sucking into the chest tube and hurting it, we're gonna have a pop-off regulator, and that's where this last pipette comes in, okay? So at some point, once the lung is reopposed, the suction will, instead of taking air from here, take the air from here. And that's the same concept as this, right? It's the whole glass blowing bubbles thing that I talked about earlier. So at some point, air is gonna be coming in, just atmospheric air is gonna be coming in to, instead of the suction seeing the lung, or the lung seeing the suction, I should say, uh, the, uh, this outside air is going to see the suction. <clears throat> now, how do you determine what the regulator is? What level, at what point do we want that pop-off to happen, where we stop sucking on the lungs so much and start popping on, or sucking on uh, the ambient air? That is determined by your level of water. And that's why this level of water is a little different, and these things have gauges, usually in centimeters of water, here. Um, so you imagine, right, we're back at the restaurant, and um, you have your little glass of water, and if that glass of water, if you remember, has just a little bit of liquid in it, and you stick your straw in and you blow, you'll blow huge bubbles super easily. You don't have to press a lot with, your, with, your, uh, you know, with the air that you're blowing in. Conversely, if you went up to a huge bucket or a 55-gallon drum, and you stuck a straw in there, and you blew, if you try to blow bubbles, the deeper that you go inside that drum, the harder it is to push bubbles, right? If you stuck a straw into a swimming pool, you would not be able to blow bubbles for the life of you, depending on how deep you were. And that's the same thing here. So the amount of water that we put into our regulator chamber um, determines at what point you'll switch over. So if we only filled this up to five cc's of water, just like our little glass, we would quickly turn over from sucking on the chest to suck in on ambient air, because there's not that much pressure to overcome, there's not a huge threshold. Usually, by dogma and by convention, we fill these radars up to 20 centimeters of water, and it's no joke, a column of water, like this, this is approximately 20 centimeters, this would be like 10, this would be like 20, and we fill this all up with water, and that's the system that we have to overcome to get the ambient air. That means that the chest has seen 20 centimeters of water suction before we switch over to ambient air decompression. Um, this would be classically a wet vac because we're putting water in here or saline in here, it doesn't matter. Um, and so for uh, some of the geeks in the room, they might uh, know the difference between a wet and a dry vac. But uh, just by schematic, this is what you need to know to know how our chest tube works. Now, a couple things. Um, if all this system is open and it's hooked up to wall suction, the way that I would describe this system is... <coughs> Let 
this system, a chest tube can be a couple different things. It can be to suction, which is what it currently is, right? We're to wall suction. It can be to water seal. And what that means is we take off the wall suction. So they're still carrying around a chest tube. They're still carrying around a pleurovac. But essentially what we're doing is we're stopping the circuit right here. That's a water seal. You're not clamping anything. You're just unhooking the suction tubing. What that means is the patient still won't get an air leak because they still have their water seal, but there's no suction. So the patient's chest has to stay inflated on its own. It's not getting any extra suction help. Uh, it can be uh, clamped. And what a clamped chest tube is, this is, this is kind of rare, and usually only thoracic surgeons or general surgeons will do this. We'll come over here to the actual chest tube itself and we'll clamp it. We would clamp a chest tube um, to simulate what it would be like to have, to have no chest tube, right? Because if this is just a piece of plastic sitting on this chest and it's clamped and it's not in communication, it's not painted with anything else, it's simulated as if what would happen if the chest tube was out. You might do this if you wanted to know, hey, I want to pull that dude's chest tube in six hours, but I want to know, is he going to fly and not reaccumulate a pneumothorax if I pull it? So we would clamp the chest tube. Um, these are really your three options. And so you're reporting on a chest tube, you're telling someone what the current status is, what you want to know is, hey, is that chest tube suction? Meaning is it hooked up to wall suction, everything's open. Is it water seal? It's not hooked up to any suction tubing, it's just dudes carrying on his pleurovac. Or is it clamped? And that means he, no joke, has a clamp on the tube. Those are the three different options that you have. The next thing you want to report is, is there an air leak? Now, with an air leak, you're going to look at a particular part of your pleurovac, which if I drew out a pleurovac, it'd be about right here. There's gonna be that air, that water collection zone. And that's essentially this, this is the Bravo chamber. Um, what you're doing there with the, uh, with the Bravo chamber, and that's hard to see, is you wanna see if there are bubbles. Cause when I first hook this chest up to suction, it's gonna suck, it's gonna reaccumulate that lung right away. It's gonna happen like instantaneously. That lung is gonna go back up to the uh, opposite, opposed, excuse me, tissue. And so initially you're gonna see a whole bunch of bubbles suck out of the chest. But over time, as that thing reinflates, there's gonna be no more bubbles. There's not supposed to be bubbles unless there's an air leak. And so if there's no more bubbles, you could report and say, the patient's chest tube is to suction, there's no air leak, meaning I don't see any bubbles in the water sealed chamber. Now, what happens if you do have an air leak? Well, that means that somewhere between here and the patient's lung, there's some sort of extraneous air getting in uh, uh, to the circuit. Where can that come from? Well, that can come from a poorly placed chest tube. Let's say that your chest tube, your sentinel hole that we talked about earlier in the break of the radio opaque line is outside the chest. Air could come through there. Let's say that someone cut your chest with a piece of scissors or a pair of scissors accidentally, air could come from there. Let's say that one of these hook, uh, hookups was loose, air could come through there. Let's say that inside the patient's chest, you did a pulmonary resection and the stapled bronchus is leaking air. Air could leak out into the chest, which would then leak through your system. Um, let's say that your patient had a hole in their chest from a gunshot wound that you didn't suture clothes or staple clothes or treat or whatever, air could come in through there. So basically, if you have an air leak, that means that at some point in this system, whether inside the patient's chest or outside of it, air is getting in your system that you don't want to be there. Okay? Um, those are really the big things to go over. So the way to report a chest tube when you're on rounds is, hey, this guy has a 32 French straight chest tube that's in his apex. It is titling. It is put out 1,000 cc's of serosanguinous fluid since placement or 20 cc's over the last shift or 30 cc's of frank blood since placement or whatever you want to say. Um, and it is currently to suction. And then lastly, you want to say whatever your plan is. So my plan is to put this chest tube to water seal and uh, shoot an x-ray in four to six hours to see you know, if his lung changes, if the fluid reaccumulates, if his pneumothorax reaccumulates, etc. cetera. Um, that's it, that's, pretty, the, that's the big uh, uh, overview of chest tubes. The one thing to note is most places that I've been have switched from an actual wet back to a dry vac, and all of that means is the way they're accomplishing this regulator function is instead of using an actual column of water, um, they're using um, 
uh, a, a piece of plastic that functions as a, as a valve to create the regulator. But you don't need to know that. The only people that need to know that are people that make Oasis or Pluribex or whatever, whoever does that. Um, some other things to talk about. I should have mentioned earlier, when it was on suction, you want to say what level of suction. So I'd say 20 centimeters of water suction. And whether it's a wet vac or a dry vac, that is the unit of measurement. So if you say that it's to 20 PSI of suction, everyone in the room will know that you don't know what you're talking about. And then um, lastly, sometimes people say, hey, um, how do I know when I can pull a chest tube, when I should recommend pulling a chest tube? And there's a couple different ways. You know, you want the patient to be hemodynamically normal and stable. You want all of their uh, uh, admission injuries to be either treated or et cetera. But the big thing that people talk about is what volume. And I would say most people agree that when a chest tube is putting out less than 100 to 150 cc's of fluid per day, uh, that chest tube can come out. A lot of people are becoming more and more aggressive with this. It depends more on the character and, uh, and quality of the fluid. So if it's frank blood, they might leave it. If it's uh, just pleural fluid, like serous fluid, they might pull out at a higher output. Uh, but in any case, um, there you go, chest tubes.